Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Society Cast. My name is Vianney Lubitz with the Alumni Society and so happy to be here and joined by all of you. I'm just gonna give it a quick minute or so before we get started, just to make sure that we give people time to log on and get settled in while we wait. And if you've been here before, you've heard me say this again, um, but I wanna encourage you to start using the chat box, which you already are, I see, which is great. Share where you're joining us from, say hello. Let me know if you can see and hear me okay. And also we've added a question to the chat box, which probably is lost now with all the great chats, but uh, we wanted to pose as leaders, you know, what have you been doing differently than you were, you know, two months ago, right, or less. Um, so feel free to share your thoughts while we have a few seconds here. We'd just love to hear from some of you and what you're doing differently. Daniel Campo, Fort Lauderdale, New York City. We've got Washington, LA, Chicago, coast to coast, I love it. All right, so I think we're just at time here, so I wanna make sure we get started and be respectful of that. So let's go ahead and get started. For those of you tuning in here now, um, again, hi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Vianney Lubis with the Alumni Society, and I just wanna take a moment to thank you for taking time out of your busy days. I know we're all quite busy these days and, and joining us here on our third Society Cats program. I hope you're all continuing to stay safe and healthy in your home. Uh, which is why you know we continue to be so glad to have this outlet and this opportunity to bring our networks together digitally. Um, I think all of us are looking at the world in new ways. We have new questions and hopefully with that some new solutions. So that is the purpose of SocietyCast. Um, it's really to help facilitate uh, inspiration, insights and innovation with our community and uh, with all of you in our networks. So before I introduce you to our wonderful speaker, um, I just wanna take a moment to quickly run through a few housekeeping items and give you a quick rundown on how the program's going to go. So we're going to have about 15 minutes with our speaker, and that will be followed by an interactive um, Q&A session with all of you. Um, so there's two main ways to ask your questions. Um, there is an ask a question feature here located just below the video screen. You can use it at any time today during the presentation to ask your questions to our speaker. And a pro tip on that, if someone has a question that is similar to yours, you can actually use that feature to upvote the question. It'll sort of rise it to the top and it'll ensure that, that we answer that for you. Um, in addition, behind the scenes, I'm going to be monitoring the um, chat box here on the right hand side, which you're all using, which is great. Um, so feel free to use that as well if you have a question. And then lastly, I want to mention if you are on Google Chrome, if that's your web browser, you actually have the option to come on screen with us and ask your question directly to the speaker. So if you want to do that, which I encourage because it'll, it'll be more interactive that way, um, let me know through the chat box as well. So let's go ahead and invite our speaker to the screen. Hello, Daisy. Hi, Vianna, Hi. how are you? Doing well, doing well. And so I wanna introduce everybody to you, to our speaker today, Daisy Oje Dominguez, who's joining us from Brooklyn, right? In your home? Yes. Mm -hmm. and so Daisy has made it her mission to make all workplaces work for everybody. Um, she spent a lifetime navigating cultural and racial identity as a Dominican, Puerto Rican, New Yorker. Woo! <laughs> and um, after two decades designing and executing diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies for companies like Moody's, Walt Disney Company, Google, she uh, really knows what it takes to that it takes real courage to reimagine and rebuild the organizational culture of the future today. So really honored to have you joining us today, Daisy, and sharing your invaluable insights, I'm sure, on, on this very timely topic of how to be a better leader during crisis. So I'll let you take the floor and then I will come back for audience Q&A. Thank you so much, Viani, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to see everyone hailing from so many different places across the country. Uh, I'm glad to be here with all of you, joining from Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Um, and I'm here to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, how to be a better leader, um, especially in these moments of crisis, because I believe that we all can. Um, at this point, leaders are under extraordinary pressure. Uh, everyone is counting on you to make the right decisions, to safeguard your employees' health, safety and livelihoods, and to set the right path forward. But how does a leader set a path forward where there is no path? How do you keep your teams whole and productive while in a constant state of unbalance, when the information available is incomplete and rapidly evolving? 
How do you help your teams redefine the work we do now and how we do it when an entire global workforce is struggling to make sense of this tremendous shock to our lives? And what role can leaders, can, as, uh, can all of you as leaders play now to tackle the underlying conditions that this crisis has exposed? The inequities and archaic operational problems that have gone untreated for years, while also building capacity for yourself and your teams to thrive in a new reality. This challenge makes me think back to one of the most influential leaders of my time. Um, it was 1999 and I was living my best life. I was a 27 year old living in New York City, working as a credit risk analyst at Moody's Investor Service. A year into my job, I was handpicked from a competitive pool of peers to join the Infrastructure Finance Group, a select group of public finance analysts at the top of their game. I was over the moon. My career was taking off and then my world fell apart. I received a call that my family had been dreading for years. My grandfather had been rushed to the hospital. I remember asking my dad weekly, is the cancer back? Yes, honey, he replied. My grandfather raised me from the age of two. At times impassioned, often stoic and stubborn, he had earned his ways. He had survived a brutal dictatorship and later exile from his home country. He raised a family that adored him. And on that first emergency hospital visit, we learned that his prostate cancer had metastasized. It had spread to his bones. It was everywhere and it was causing him tremendous pain pain that he had been bearing for months without letting anybody know. With a diagnosis of perhaps six months to live, we set out to ensure his quality of life. For what seemed like weeks, we became regular fixtures in the hospital's family waiting room. We were that Dominican family that nobody could get rid of. I could barely keep from crying when I shared the news with my new boss. I didn't know what to expect or what steps I could take. I was a junior analyst barely getting my sea legs. And I'll never forget my manager's response. I lost my father a few years ago, she said, and barely a day goes by that I don't think of him. You should be in the hospital with your grandfather and your family. We'll make it work. I was quickly assigned a VPN, a virtual privacy network for my laptop, even though I didn't qualify because of my job responsibilities. I was allowed to work from the hospital until my grandfather could return home. And over the next few weeks, I would go into the office a few times a week to update the team on projects and pick up new assignments. And when he died about two months later, I was allowed an extended bereavement leave so that I could travel to the Dominican Republic for his burial. My manager did not follow a manual in how to show deep empathy and care. She just did it. I remain indebted to her kindness and support. And I pay it back by not only trying to model her actions, but also encouraging other leaders like all of you to embrace empathy, inclusion, and purpose. Managing during a crisis is perhaps the most underappreciated and overlooked leadership quality until a crisis hits. Generally, leaders are expected to set vision and strategy, drive growth, and ensure financial health. These days, you're also expected to stabilize, to recover, and strengthen your business while you and your teams are dealing with heightened levels of uncertainty and anxiety. All of this, as you also help your teams cope with operating in remote work environments, where fostering human connection, the cornerstone of inclusive and engaged workforces is more important than ever and harder. During a crisis, the culture you create will define your organization. Now is a time for leaders to think about what type of leader they need to be for all of their workers, especially the most vulnerable and marginalized. The key is to prioritize empathy, calm, and purpose. So let's begin with empathy. The first things to go in a moment of crisis are perspective and empathy. Leading with empathy in a crisis calls for heightened sensitivity to the marginalization of underrepresented and vulnerable members of your teams. Like my boss did for me, you can create a sense of inclusion and belonging for your people by sharing how this is personally, emotionally, and cognitively affecting you. By being willing to admit you don't have all the solutions, it can give your employees a window into your thoughts and feelings, your humanity, 
By doing so, you also signal to others that it is safe for them to do so. Sharing honestly, empathetically, and frequently builds trust, understanding, and stronger team connections now and in the future. So what does that look like? Communicate with heart. Add brief relationship check-ins at the start and end of your virtual meetings. Pick up the phone and check in with team members with no agenda other than to connect. Embrace complex conversations about how you and your organization are or should be addressing the needs of all employees. For example, those without accessible virtual tools, those most invisible or least connected to the rest of the team now that work is being done outside of the boundaries of a physical space, or Asian and Asian American employees, people of queer identity or with a disability who find themselves in increasingly unsafe remote workspaces. Visibly demonstrate your willingness to listen to different voices and make sure all diverse viewpoints are considered. A simple plus one or saying that's an important idea, let's hear more, can make all the difference for those generally silenced in group meetings. You can also try asking directly, do you feel comfortable and safe to share in a remote work environment? What would make this easier? And finally, conduct a thorough diagnostic to better understand the challenges everyone is facing personally and emotionally, as well as their emotional readiness today and in the coming months. Some of your team members may be home alone and feeling isolated. Others may be managing extended family in their homes and abroad, three children in a demanding homeschool curriculum. Getting a baseline of your people data means moving beyond knowing who are your frontline workers, your individual contributors, your managers, and where they sit, to understanding how many are parenting, taking care of elders or extended family, including the different ages and needs of their children or dependents, if any. Now get to know what they're experiencing and how they're experiencing it so that you can better target your messaging, so that you can better identify incentives, recognitions, and rewards, so that you can better plan for how to reskill or upskill, and even think about new team, team um, rituals that can have the greatest impact at this moment and into the future. Now let's go to the second one, leading with calm. This is a time to manage the present while leading for what's ahead, including outperforming your competitors. These are times to be radically calm, to not only fix today's gaps, but to also inspire resilience, to stay level-headed, and to think disruptively. So what does that look like? Like my boss did for me, lead by example. Stay close to your people and the pulse of your organization while being physically distanced. If the signals are low, it may mean that your team members don't feel safe asking uncomfortable questions or making difficult decisions. If the signals are overwhelming, it may mean your teams are operating with a lack of clarity over what's next and flagging morale. This is when you need to inspire and rally your teams to take forward action. On video chats, model the behavior you want others to see. Share how you're coping through confusion and uncertainty and how you're thinking about business continuity while doing the right thing by your teams. Amplify stories of those who are leading the way and lessons that you are learning personally. Show care and normalize mental health by checking in on everyone's well-being and naming the emotions and feelings we're all experiencing, including the conditions that can enable each person to be at their best especially as we're all juggling added stressors and responsibilities. Instead of asking, are you okay? Try, how is your day going? What worries you most right now? What, if anything, might prevent you from being present today? This is also a great time to ask your teams, what might be missing from our approach to work? What have we learned from past crises and downturns? What are we learning now and what could we be doing differently? And the third is leading with purpose. Every organization has a purpose, a reason for being, the North Star that inspires and drives them forward. It propels everything that you do. And your values are tied directly to your purpose, defining who you are, how you act, and the ways that you work. Leading with purpose in crisis means that you double down on your purpose and values, that you reset expectations 
and that you center on your people. It also means that you turn your good intentions into action. So what does that look like? Like my boss did for me, use your purpose to guide how you make tough and complex decisions. Be clear on what behaviors are true to your values, relevant to the moment and to what's coming next. Get your team's feedback on how they can best contribute to both productivity and the well-being of the team. Test out assumptions about technology, communication channels, and even FaceTime. Bring the team together to share what works and what doesn't based on their own circumstances, and then establish new rituals and routines with the team's buy-in. Give your teams as much heads up as you can about upcoming changes so that you can help them prepare for what's next and be willing to explain your decision-making process and the trade-offs of your choices, because there are always trade-offs. Consider building a laboratory for tough conversations where all team members can share difficult things with each other without fear of disrespect or risk to their personal safety and careers. Encourage team members to check and call out blind spots and weaknesses. Model and thread allyship throughout your organization. Being an ally means more than just recognizing your privilege and agreeing that people from underrepresented and marginalized groups should be valued and accepted. It means normalizing the use of preferred pronouns by sharing yours, speaking up against passive aggressive racist statements, calling attention to the emotional and psychological labor of marginalized groups and learning from your mistakes. To do all of this may mean that for many of you, you're gonna have to build new muscles including the capacity to interpret new information, to build cultural empathy for those different than you, to sit in ambiguity, conflict, and discomfort, and to determine what's possible when you witness workplace inequities. How you act in the coming weeks and months will likely define your organizations for years to come. Right now, it's unclear how this global pandemic will affect the future of work. Will remote offices become the norm? Will handshakes ever return? Will the economy and financial systems bounce back? Much of life is uncertain, but I do know that in moments of instability and stress, people are more likely to rely on their implicit biases when making decisions, which can often lead to increasing instability for vulnerable and marginalized groups. The future of work is here. Rules are being rewritten every day, and the old playbooks, they're useless. What we can do now is lead with empathy, calm, and purpose as we radically rebuild the future of work in a dynamic world. As my friend Dr. Cindy Pace has said, you're either leading or you're lagging. The question that I want to leave all of you with today is, how do you want your leadership to be remembered when this crisis is over? Thank you. Thank you so much, Daisy. That was so inspiring. You said so many things that I uh, wrote down very ferociously here. Um, I especially love the relationships check-in. That's a really nice point and tip for meetings before and after. That's wonderful. Um, so let's turn it over to you all and to Q&A. We have a couple already. I have one of my own as well, if we can get to it. Um, so let's start with the first from Bernardo Ferdman. Wonderful and inspiring ideas and suggestions, Daisy. Thank you. Question, how do you apply these in the context of the massive layoffs, cutbacks, salary reductions and furloughs, et cetera? Can you connect to equity and inequality? Absolutely. And hola, Bernardo. Good to, good to hear from you if, uh, if, if through this question. Um, you know, I think, it, I think it's, it's actually very much about like I said, doubling down on your purpose and your values. Um, if anyone's familiar, you can look this up online. The CEO of, um, of Carta, uh, Carta, I'm a, I, I always mispronounce that with my, my Spanish and my English, um, recently published a, um, and it's on, uh, on Medium, he recently published the communications that he shared with his team when he did layoffs. Um, and it was incredibly powerful um, because he was, in, he was transparent about it. He talked about the trade-offs. He talked about the decisions that he made. He, I, he identified decisions based on both shareholder value, but also how to do the right thing by the people that were gonna be laid off. Um, and, and he wrote, he, he, 
he read all of this to his team and then he published it so that others could could review it and i think that is a really wonderful example of a leader mm -hmm. that is leading through values and that is thinking as equitably as possible uh, and uh, around all this all of the stakeholders involved um and who really tried to center people first by by letting everybody in on his thought process and the decisioning that it, that it took and by taking full responsibility for every decision so i encourage everybody to uh look this up it's um it's uh i think it's titled uh carda's covid 19 layoff and the ceo's name is henry ward how do you spell Cardas? So I'm going to put it in the chat. C-A-R-T-A. Got it. Carta. Carta. COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Got it. Great. Um, and actually, there's a question here around resources that I think we all love to hear a lot about resources and go-tos. For you specifically, what are your go-to resources that you're relying on right now during this period for thought leadership, maybe podcasts, um, mediums? There's so much right now, <laughs> um, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm a human capital uh, executive, I focus, I'm focusing a lot on really what are, what are a lot of consultants out there talking about um, from, uh, from the lens of coming back to work, best practices. So I read and watch anything from uh, McKenzie, Corn Ferry, um, HR executive. Um, I'm, I'm also, you know, the Atlantic. Uh, HBR, Harvard Business Review. There's just a lot of really good literature and solutions that are coming out right now for folks. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you know, I, I recommend to you that you go into these publications and see what works for you and what are the solutions that people are um, are offering. Some of them are highly operational, and I'm I'm very keen on when I think about equity. Mm -hmm. It's very much about making sure that we're putting the right systems and processes in place. And so I'm I'm keeping a very keen eye on how are people approaching not just layoffs and furloughs um, but also the re-entry question what does that look like um, what are, how, how are people communicating and so I'm looking for those types of signals that's great and put those on the the chat box as well for people to, yeah. to review um, you know this is a question that I have for you um, I've just been you talked about marginalized communities in your in your um, talk just now but you've been very vocal about this on LinkedIn which I've really appreciated your insights around um, you know this 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 conversation on that the crises is not an equalizer, right? And that this crisis is not being experienced equally, right? And it has, and it's intensifying long lasting inequity, inequities that have existed for so long. So what is, can you elaborate a little bit mm -hmm. on that? It's, it's been coming up a lot in even our virtual happy hours. Um, I think it's on top of a lot of people's minds. So I would love to hear your thoughts about that. Sure. Um, you know, I think for many of us that have gone through crisis in the past, we know that in moments of crisis is when biases really flare up and where our circles of influence get really, really tiny. Um, and there are um, loads of historical references that can speak to that. Uh, I'll, I'll focus specifically when it comes to diversity and inclusion, because that's what that's been what I've been um, speaking and communicating a lot more about when you when you look at the history of um, uh, professional diversity and inclusion in workplaces all the way from the 80s till uh, till today, you'll see that every time there's been an economic downturn, the first things to get caught to get cut are diversity and inclusion initiatives. And then mm -hmm. when the economy comes back, then everybody starts, you know, really gearing up to diversifying workforces and, you know, protect, they start and then it's again. Um, and so when when this when when COVID started, um, sort of, you know, when, when we all went into quarantine, my first reaction to that was, what can I contribute and what can I do now to ensure that we are not making the same mistakes of the past? And, and most importantly, that we are caring for those who are most vulnerable and marginalized in these moments. And so, you know, I would, I would often hear, I would be in conversations with people who would say, well, this is a great equalizer. Or the other, the other expression that people are using is, well, you know, we're all in the same boat. And there was this great piece um, it was on Twitter, and then I believe it was in, oh my gosh, I think in the Washington Post. Um, I can't remember the the author right now, but um, what he said was, we're, we're all not in the same boat. We're all in the same storm. But many of us are in different boats. Some of us are in yachts. Some of us barely have an oar to get to the other side. Some of us, like myself, are in pretty comfortable boats right now. We're all shaking through this, but we are not not in the same boat. Um, and and I, I'm just trying to really focus on how do we continue to emphasize that, particularly for leaders, so that you are able to reduce the blind spots and open up your view set around how do you care for others. 
That's beautiful. I love that, by the way. That's a great way to think about it. Um, there's another question that just came through mm -hmm. that I want to ask before we, um, hope, this might be our last question, just given time, but in what ways do you think business and leadership will look different when this period is over? Are you optimistic that there will be a cultural shift or will we, or will we go back to business as usual? I am the eternal optimist. Uh -huh. um, but I also fully acknowledge that human beings, the one thing that we often do is forget. Um, we forget what, what, what we have lived. We forget, um, we forget others. Um, and so I, I, the, the, the shorter, the crisper answer to that is that it's impossible for work and how we do it to be the same as it was before. Um, because we, we, this is the first time that we have all gone through such a drastic experience really as you know as, as collectively as possible even though we're you know we're all experiencing it differently um i think that what we're going to see is our changes operationally we're going to see changes in you know how how we do work where we do it we've we've all you know all of these promises of working from home and flexibility that we've been talking about for years we all we've all tested it right we've got proof points of what mm -hmm. works and what doesn't all of that is going to change and all of that as we've been learning in a really painful way in the last couple of weeks requires a very different leadership model. It requires a very different right. engagement model. It requires calling people in in many different ways. And so I, I do think that what we're going to see shortly and in the medium to long term is just a, a need to upscale management um, management capabilities mm -hmm. in a way that, that requires us to not rely on the simplistic notions of, well, I'm going to see that person in my office or I'm going to see them in the hallways. Um, right. I also do believe that, um, and I've said this often in my, in my speech now, it's empathy and care are mm -hmm. the, um, pro seen as much more principal needs for workplaces. Now, we're still going to have stakeholder needs like shareholders and bottom line that, that that will always be part of the corporate structure. But I do think that it's impossible for us to not have been shaken enough to, right. be, to be willing to reimagine what this looks like. Yeah. Um, absolutely. You know, and before we go, I, I wanted I want to acknowledge some of the conversations that people share, some of the insights we asked at the beginning of the the talk today. How what are they doing differently than they perhaps were not doing uh, two months ago? And and Bernardo Ferdman said he's trying to worry less about everyday mm -hmm. issues and he's learning yoga at a beginner level. <laughs> so that's great, Bernardo. Keep that up. <laughs> Eduardo Villavicencio says, I've been taking more stretch breaks and walks in my neighborhood. Um, so that's lovely. And Diana mm -hmm. Bruce just shared she's pivoting to help educators un understand that laws that still apply, um, best practices for creating gender inclusive virtual classrooms and school districts. Uh, we know what to do. We just need to be reminded with some shifts in our practice that affirm students across gender identities and expression. So that's beautiful, Diana. Absolutely. Thank you for your work. Um, so I think that's it. That's all the time we have for today. Um, I just want to thank everybody for your questions and for joining us. And Daisy, thank you so much. This was uh, incredible and your insights were uh, so, so invaluable. So looking forward to, to hearing more from you in the, in the days to come. If thank you so wants, much. Of course. And if you want to watch this again, share it with your networks, you can do so um, after today. So this replay will be available in um, our Alumni Study Crowdcast channel. Um, and then we'd love your feedback. Let us know what you thought of today. Always looking to hear what topics you want to hear from next. Uh, up next to, I think, Eduardo Villavicencio joined us today. Um, next for us is May 14th. That's in two weeks. We're going to hear from, from him. He is a Gallup certified strengths coach. He's going to be mm -hmm. sharing strategies for fostering well-being in ourselves, in our familia, in our communities uh, in the midst of this life right now, this new normal. So looking forward to that. Uh, join us, and uh, you can register using our Crowdcast page. Besides that, thank you so much, Daisy. Again, appreciate Take your care, time. Everyone. Stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you soon. Be well. Bye.